Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to our session. My name is Zohar, and I prepared this presentation with Alina, but she couldn't be here today, uh, but, and she will be joining us via recordings. So today, we will share with you our uh, experience of creating a research platform for genomic workloads. This platform <coughs> sorry, allows our data science users to run their algorithms on thousands of samples on demand. We achieve this using Airflow's dynamic DAG generation, uh, coupled with the processing power of EC2 machines, autoscaling groups, and the ECS cluster. A little bit about us. Um, I joined C2I Genomics three years ago. I was the first data engineer and the second overall software engineer. And Alina? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Zohar. Uh, my name is Alina. I, I joined C2I Genomics two years ago, and together with Zohar, we established the data engineering team. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, so during this session, we will uh, explain C2I Genomics mission and technology. We will then focus on the challenges of the data, of, of genomic data and the processing power needed to analyze it. Then we will uh, explain the use case for our data science platform and the requirements for our platform. Then Alina will guide us through the, um, how we are using Airflow and the ECS cluster to give our users superpowers. Uh, afterwards, we'll share some future directions with you. And lastly, we will go over the development experience, timeline, and milestones. Almost every second, um, a patient is diagnosed with cancer. And there are treatments, and cancer can be a chronic disease if it is managed and monitored at the right times. Uh, <clears throat> we also know that early detection of cancer greatly improves the chances for a positive outcome for the patient. But current detection methodologies like MRI and CT uh, rely on the tumor being big enough to be detected in imaging in a photograph. So in C2I Genomics, we develop a cloud diagnostic platform that uses a simple blood test, AI, and all genome pattern recognition to detect cancer on the genomic level. And our method also does it months and even years before other methods. So, What's going on is that tumor normal cells uh, extract DNA into the bloodstream. And in that blood sample, we can detect and quantify tiny amounts of residual um, uh, DNA, DNA that originates from the tumor. So one of the applications of our technology is early detection of cancer recurrence. Uh, th that means that after a patient is diagnosed and they remove the tumor, uh, we can follow it up and detect when it returns. Sorry. <clears throat> so when a tumor is surgically removed, a tiny amounts of residual disease may still remain at a level that is undetectable by imaging or any other current blood-based technologies. Due to this uncertainty, right, the uncertainty being if we completely remove the tumor or not, some patients can be over-treatment over-treated with toxic chemotherapy or radiation, and others may not receive the necessary treatment while the residual disease slowly progresses and metastasizes throughout their body. The C2I detection results can inform the clinician's decision to escalate or de-escalate the treatment. For, from a data flow standpoint, the operations begin, begin at the lab. So, uh, the lab can uh, get a tumor sample or a blood sample, and it ad undergoes a similar process. First, they extract the DNA from the sample. Then they use next-generation sequencing technologies to read the DNA uh, into uh, genomic sequences of GATC. Those sequences are uh, 150 bases long, and for one sample, we get about 600 million sequences. Now, uh, the lab digitizes the files, and the files are very compressed, but still we get about 100 gigabytes per sample. 
Uh, the lab then uploads the data into the cloud, and this is where our SaaS solution begins. Um, first, for the use case I described before, we, um, we get the tumor samples, and we generate a mutation signature for that specific tumor for that specific subject. Uh, that we will later use it to track those mutations in the blood. So periodically, when a subject is monitored for cancer, um, uh, ju just monitored like after a month, uh, two months after a year, we can take a, the blood sample and we can add, add those mutations that we identified uh, from the tumor in the blood. If a patient is cancer free, there should be no mutations in the blood. And our methodology is also highly sensitive and we can detect even one in 10,000 cells that uh, uh, originate from the tumor in the blood. So developing this kind of pipeline has many parts. And like I said, we first begin with a small pieces of DNA, 150 pieces. And the first question is, where are they located in the human genome? And the human genome is three billion bases long. So this is called the alignment phase. And to answer this kind of question, we need to utilize the biggest and baddest machines available on AWS. Then we also want to make sure that our, uh, the sample that we got is of good quality. So for example, we want to make sure that each of those sequences are unique. So one in 600 million sequences, we need to make sure uh, that they are unique. You can also see that we are accumulating more and more data. And this is because for each sequence now, we also have the location and also some quality metrics uh, attached to it. Uh, then for the signature generation and our proprietary algorithms, we use advanced AI and machine learning models to, um, to analyze the aligned file and get a detection result. Okay, so this is a very simplified um, illustration of our pipeline, but let's say, for example, our data science user wants to create a new algorithm, and they want to test it on a thousand sam samples, and they want to use that aligned file, which is 200 gigabytes per sample, and also use four CPUs for each of those analyses. So they will actually need 200 terabytes of storage and 4,000 CPUs. <laughs> there is no one EC2 for this uh, uh, so we need to distribute the load. What our data scientist actually needs is a platform that will allow them to run their algorithm on thousands of samples without worrying about provisioning the infrastructure. Let's go over some of the requirements uh, for our platform. So first of all, when I'm saying a, a data set, Sometimes we mean um, a thousand samples and sometimes we need just a couple of samples to run and test our algorithm on. So uh, our workflow must be dynamic in the way that it creates the task and also the way that it provisions the infrastructure. Our workflows can also be very complex, so it would be super useful to visualize them. We mentioned <laughs> very large files. And we are also creating more files in the research platform. And we want to make sure that we are saving them in a way that our data scientists can share and analyze them together. So they need to be in a dynamic but ordered shared space. And of course, um, we need full reproducibility for our results. So we need to track all the inputs, parameters, and conversions that created those results. As I mentioned, we need a lot of power. So CPU, GPU, RAM. Um, yeah. In terms of user experience, when we are running a thousand samples, uh, sometimes things, things go wrong. So we need a way for our users to track the problems and access to the logs is crucial for this kind of thing. And lastly, but certainly, certainly not leastly, uh, is our ability to fully comply with uh, the regulations of GDPR and APA and other uh, security measures. Okay, so to summarize what we need is uh, some way to shorten the development cycle for our data scientists. And we know we are asking for a lot here, and this is why we have Alina in recordings to guide us through the solution. 
Uh, hi again. Uh, so I will present our architecture. We'll start from a high level overview, then go over how the solution meets our needs and then drill down to each component. Our users are the data scientists which develop and run the algorithm code. Once the data scientists developed or upgraded the code, they want to test it on multiple datasets and compare the results with the previous versions if needed. They will push their changes to the Azure repositories, which will trigger a CI CD that will automatically update the Elastic Container Registry, which is an AWS Docker registry. Now the code is ready to be run on Airflow. The user can specify the dataset and the parameters they want to run using a predefined uh, JSON configuration file. The DAG is parsed according to the requested configuration file, and each dataset element creates a separate task in the ECS. Each task utilizes the ECS operator, uh, sends a request to the ECS cluster with specification of storage and compute needs. Uh, how this solution meets our requirements? The first requirement was the dynamic workflow. Airflow allows us to run workflows with the same code base on different inputs and parameters that will parse the configuration file specifically. Different datasets and configurations, for example, run on 600 samples and choose which models to use. Uh, data and code reusability. As Python developers, Airflow was the most intuitive choice for us and for our data scientists. This makes it easy to create dynamic workflow, reuse a code across different tags. We can easily define our own oper operators or reuse and extend existing operators like the ECS operator that allows us to utilize the AWS compute powers. The use of ECR allows us uh, to run the same code from different workflows. This also allows the traceability because of ECR versions and tags. Uh, we are utilizing S3 to save all our outputs in well-defined paths combined with the code versions, inputs, and parameters, which enables full results reproducibility. Robust processing power is answered with Airflow scaling uh, and the ECS compute powers allows us to scale and utilize any resources we require. Monitor and user experience, so the easy UI made it user-friendly and accessible to our data scientists. It allows them to run the DAG to retry tasks, to easily see the failed tasks, etc. Uh, regarding security and compliance, we are using managed Amazon Airflow installed on a virtual private cloud on AWS per region installation. That means that our traffic is fully isolated from the public internet and that we don't have cross-regional traffic. Essentially, our processing is decentralized and meets the data where it resides. Uh, some extras, like we mentioned before, we deployed the MWAA, basically Airflow using a managed AWS Airflow, which was... Alina, where did you go? So sorry. It was super easy and quick deployment and didn't require a lot of maintenance. And of course, the community support. Airflow is well known for its active ecosystem of contributors and users, which helped us a lot along the way. And now that we understand how this meets our needs, let's go over each component of the architecture, starting with the CI CD. So, the Algo developer developed a new code or update an existing code base. We deploy the CI CD that builds a Docker image and pushes the image to an Elastic Container Registry, AWS, in all the relevant regions. This process of developing and deploying algorithms allows the data scientist full freedom of code changes and deployment, while it also enforces code readiness and connects the tagged ECR version to the commit for the results traceability. Um, in this point, the code is updated in all the region and is ready in all the regions and is ready to be run on Airflow. Here you can see an example of the dynamic DAG processes. The user updates a JSON configuration file with parameters and inputs. Tasks will be created and run parallel based on the dataset inputs that the user specified. 
When the DAG is parsed, the user can review the run info uh, in the DAG docs before invoking the run. You can see here the information regarding the DAG. You can see the S3 output path, the number of inputs, uh, the dataset name, the last update date of the parameter file, region, etc. Once the DAG is triggered, airflow workers, workers will start scaling. Um, so, in this video, you can see how the number of tasks is updated based on the configuration file. We have 131 task groups per patient, and for each patient, another 10 samples. This grouping is mainly for the UI, but all the tasks will run in parallel, so we're talking about more than 1,000 tasks. When we start the run, uh, Airflow worker, workers will start scaling up, and more and more tasks will start running. Each task is utilizing the ECS operator and will ask for compute and storage resources from the cluster. We needed to heavily modify the ECS operator to handle our massive scaling needs from the cluster, specifically uh, throttling exceptions that we encountered in the interface between Airflow and the ECS cluster. First, for the start run request, there is a hard limit on, on the number of requests per second. We added a randomized delay before execution not to have all the requests at the same time. Regarding get log events, during the run, Airflow sends a request to the CloudWatch to get the logs from the ECS task that is running to, allows us, to allow us to see them in the Airflow UI. This request runs every few seconds uh, during the run. So we added a retry mechanism with a growing time delay before each retry not to fail on a throttling exception. And the last is the described task. task request. The ECS operator sends a request to the cluster to check the status of the execution, to update the status of the task in Airflow accordingly. Also here we added the retry mechanism and the delay before each retry, before we just failed on the throttling exceptions. The next step is the ECS cluster. So, as we discussed, the ECS operator sends a request to the ECS cluster to run. It specifies which image we are running, ECR, the launch type specification, if it's AWS Fargate or an EC2, and the task definition, which has all the information regarding the compute and storage resources. For example, our task needs 64 CPU cores to run plus one terabyte of EBS storage. This will be specified in the task definition and in the, LAN and in the launch template of the capacity provider. The cluster reacts to this request by checking if there are instances that can supply these resources. If there are no resources available, it will scale the cluster and launch instances according to our needs. The cluster allows us to request any resource we require that is available on AWS. We utilized both Graviton-based and AMD instances, spots, and on-demand. It can also utilize different availability zones and diverse type of instances. Regarding the security, the cluster and its resources are in the same private VPC as Airflow, which means that the traffic between Airflow and the cluster doesn't leave the private network. So just to summarize everything, once the user triggers the DAG, Airflow is scaling to meet the needs of the required tasks. The cluster is scaling according to the needs, and the user can monitor all the running everything in the Airflow UI. When the tasks are finished, the results are available with all the run information and algorithm performance in S3. And this is our solution and infrastructure. I hope it was clear as much as possible. Uh, Zar will now continue and share with you our plans and takeaway from this project. Enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you, and uh, back to you, Zar. Thank you, Alina. Uh, okay. Uh, so our infrastructure got us this far, uh, but we still have ways to go. Um, if, for example, what we uh, POC recently was uh, switching to, uh, like Alina said, the, the Graviton-based. Okay. 
uh, the graviton based uh, uh, docker architecture and actually from a five hour run we reduced the runtime to three hours so that was a 40 percent reduction and also those are less expensive so overall we reduce it by 50 percent and we want to poc uh, moving all our workloads the next thing is, of course, we want to switch to EKS. Alina showed you some of the problems that we encountered with ECS. And all the cool kids are going to EKS. And also, uh, we want to at least switch from one set of problems to another set of problems. Uh, another thing that we are not doing uh, so well is uh, some of the tasks on the same workflows, they use uh, the, um, the they, they download big files. Uh, and they actually can share them if we were to use like advanced sto storage options like FS6 for Luster or EFS. So in terms of scale, uh, this is coming from our users. <laughs> they want more and we need some way to do it. Uh, currently, I don't have many ideas on that. <laughs> uh, the last thing that we are not doing so well is uh, we have trouble monitoring the, run the runs. So if a data science user requested thousands uh, of uh, of tasks, then uh, we don't really know how to tell him to separate within problems in the infrastructure on, of, and problems from uh, their code. So uh, we really need to have some kind of dedicated uh, management system for this and uh, for data engineer uh, database is the most uh, intuitive. So last thing we want to share with you is uh, our experience um, and uh, we, we really, really started from humble uh, beginnings. I had very little knowledge about Airflow, and I had experience with the Kubernetes, but never, I never set up a cluster. So, uh, but within two months uh, of uh, Alina joining the team, uh, we had a POC running, and also users started uh, to run workloads on the solutions. Um, so that was super cool. Um, Yes, yeah, since then uh, we extended our uh, solution and uh, functionality for the users. We also privatized the uh, networking. And, um, and now that the use case we explained before can run multiple times um, uh, per day. And we also use the platform for many other workloads. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions about genomics, how we use Airflow, the cluster, or any of the video games I mentioned before, feel free to contact us in emails uh, or here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elena and Zor. Uh, any questions from the audience? Hi. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, I think you briefly mentioned that some of your processes are running over for uh, like five hours to do some of these analytics. What was your initial challenges with like scalability or like optimizing your processes? Because I, I imagine whenever you started, the runtimes might have been even larger before like fully implementing auto scaling. Yeah, actually uh, five hours is, is kind of the low ball <laughs> park that we are doing. Uh, the, those processes can run uh, 12 hours and more. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, again, was setting up the, the cluster at the beginning. Um, but once we had it up and running and we use on demand, so th th they worked, but we started to mess around with how to make them better and how we, um, how to do more. Um, and then we started to run on, on all of those API problems, right, the throttling. And this, this is where we are stuck right now. We have no idea how to scale from this. Could you tell us more about your decision to use ECS as your uh, compute infrastructure instead of a traditional, uh, let's say, distributed compute framework like Spark? The genomic workloads that we are running, uh, they need um, uh, they, they need specialized dockers uh, and, and installations uh, for them. Th this is mostly, uh, other than our proprietary code, which fortunately is mostly Python, but they uh, use R and they use um, uh, like uh, C stuff and, and stuff like this. So, so actually we, we have to have some kind of way to use Docker. So containers was the best way. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Excellent. Two questions I have. The first question, what were the factors you thought of going with the managed service instead of the installing yourself on using the open airflow? And the second question, uh, 
what data points you are using to scale your workers because that is definitely in your case you are scaling a lot but how are you doing that uh, can you repeat the first question so yeah so what were the factors you went ahead with the managed service with the aws instead oh. of installing on your own as open source yeah just just first just we wanted to do it first and we want to 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 uh, get the value out because Actually, on the timeline, what, what really took the, m the most time was uh, me convincing the management uh, to do this kind of thing, because this is not classical data engineering stuff. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so we just wanted to do it first. And actually, MWA was really nice to us. Uh, we do have some scaling problems with it also. E each time we um, like uh, eliminate one, limit then we reach another so there was a point where the, uh, we had a lot of problems with airflow and actually the service team from aws really helped us out there and we know we are not using airflow in the most optimized ways also because uh, alina showed you the dynamic dags but we actually again uh, we need to do task uh, dynamic tasks right now i think uh, if you want to to scale up the airflow team sorry <laughs> and the second question was about the worker scaling how are you doing that? So, right, so the airflow worker scaling, uh, this is again uh, the MWA part. Um, uh, I think at the backend they use Fargates. <laughs> so, so mostly like how we are scaling. Uh, and um, yeah, it takes time. Our, our users definitely uh, are, uh, they, they want it faster, um, but uh, it does the job, right? They, they Any particular go. matrices you are using or data points you are using to scale them out? Uh, we are not scaling oh, the so airflow MWA workers. Is yeah. Doing that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, so, um, my question is that the the files that you are processing uh, in the raw format, you mentioned some sizes, right? You know, like several terabytes each or something, or gigabytes. I I can't remember. But what was the uh, when I saw that there were thousand tasks. Uh, so, how was this file actually causing a thousand tasks to be uh, created? Like, what was the reason for doing a thousand tasks for it? Uh, I, so, so, each sample, like blood sample, is actually, uh, we, um, it varies, but, but around 200 gigabytes. So, what you actually uh, saw when Alina showed you uh, is that each sample, right, uh, um, we generate a task for it on the airflow. Okay. And then, Airflow provisions an entire EC2 with dedicated storage that fits on it. So it's per per sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We process per sample. Per sample. Uh, so that's how many samples were there? Like thousand. We can comfortably ask for a few thousand, but then the, the actual concurrency can be a thousand. Okay. Uh, it depends, like on Fargate or EC2. It depends. Cool. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, this uh, takes us, leads us to break. Thanks. Good job. <laughs>